Hi, everyone. Out there in the world, everyone's gone crazy for the Beatles. Yep, the Get Back special. Peter Jackson has done a great job to bring us the three-part documentary from all the film that Michael Lindsay Hogg has filmed. And I want to introduce you to Matt Hurwitz. He's a great Beatle expert. Great to have you on, Matt. Good to be here. Now, i got to tell you, we have the man. He's Australian, by the way. Right? We're lucky enough to get Les Parrot on. The man that was there that actually filmed the Beatles at Twickenham, on the roof, the Get Back Roof concert, and at Savile Row. And we welcome you so much, Les. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, what we'll do is we'll get straight into it. And let's hear a few stories of that fantastic time back in 1969 from you. I mean, obviously, I knew who the Beatles were. Yes, and obviously, I, I was a Beatle fan. And Tony, the cameraman, and I had done a few things together. And he rang me up one day and said, um, look, uh, we've got this gig with the Beatles. I don't know how long it's going to go. Uh, not quite sure. But we're going to film the rehearsing at Twickenham from Monday. And we may get end up with a concert. He said, but look, um, there's plenty of money around, so go in strong. And I said, oh, OK. So when I did negotiate with the producer, um, I basically asked for initially almost twice what a bank manager in a high street would have got. <laughs> so um, he knocked me down a little bit. But in the end, I was quite pleased to be getting um, a considerable amount of money, which he guaranteed for three weeks. So I joined the whole show quite happy. <laughs> and you hadn't you hadn't been a camera operator yet, right? This was your first. No, job. That's right. Um, yeah. Tony said to me, look, um, I've been his focus puller on several gigs. And, uh, and he said, look, um, I want to boost you up to operator. He said, you'll probably get the same sort of flack I did because Tony was quite a, a novel person. He went from being basically a focus puller, first camera assistant, and he didn't do operating. He went straight, he got a break and went straight to lighting. And um, the old school of uh, camera film, film industry in Britain didn't regard that as being the correct thing to do. You basically came up the ranks or you, or else. Yeah, right. Right. Amazing. I just want to ask you something, Les, right? When you watch the Get Back special, now that part where Paul and Ringo are left by themselves and they got tears in their eyes and you see that close up, do you know who filmed that? Oh, I don't recall. And you see the tears in their eyes. I've never seen anything like it before and I'm just saying... Yeah. To me, that's a Grammy-winning moment, just that. But I also got to say, you know what I really like, Liz? And I don't know if you filmed it. That's what I got to ask you. It doesn't matter if you have or you haven't. But when Ringo comes in and goes, I've got a song, and he goes, Octopus's Garden, plays two verses, then turns around and goes, that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah, Les, you shot that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the <clears> – <throat> Ringo went on to tell us the motivation and where Octopus came from. Him, he, he and his wife, Maureen, were in Spain on holiday and they were at a restaurant, a cafe, and the waiter told them the story because they ordered they, they ordered calamari. And uh, the waiter said, you know, the octopus, when he's out there, he gathers little bits of pieces and leaves them outside of the cave. It's almost like his garden. And that's where the whole thing came from. You had a good, you had a, a, re a really cool thing you got. You told a wonderful story about... Um... You know, when you got when you were working at Apple and they were all very comfortable and you would look for if there was something cool going, you saw him scribbling on something. Tell that story. Just one day there was I mean, Ringo wasn't as you see from the, the Peter Jackson edit, he's he's not the most verbal person. He was often just sitting up there waiting, going with the flow. But one day I noticed he was looking more preoccupied than at normal. So I, at that time, by the time we got to Savile Row. We were invisible, if you wish. We could do anything. There was no no-go zone. We could put the camera anywhere. They were totally relaxed. And so I, I went behind Ringo, and he had a little business card, to, uh, and he was sketching on it. And eventually, I, I, I couldn't make it out. So I said, what is that? And he said, well, I was home last night with Maureen, and we were watching the TV, and that ad came on where this James Bond-type character does amazing stunts, and ends up leaving a box of black magic chocolates on her bedside and leaves this little card. And the logo said, all because the lady loves. When the ad finished, Maureen looks over at me and says, you never do anything like that for me. 
Well, tonight <laughs> I'm going to put the box of chocolates by her bedside, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> you guys filming, and I'm saying it's very important because I've seen the Get Back film where you're in the camera looking at it. Now, when you look back, do you do you guys know that you actually did like a first reality film like Big Brother before it was even invented and anyone knew about it because you take us right there and that is reality TV before reality TV. You guys are pioneers, even on the camera. It was another Australian who reinvented that type of TV, would you believe? He came to London and he set up a current affairs show called World in Action. And he was the one who showed that the cameras could capture real life. Before that, it was all three-piece suits and quiet gentlemen interviewing quiet gentlemen. Uh, this guy came, Tim, 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 Tim. But he, he was another sort of young Murdoch of the TV world. And he, he, and the first thing he said to all his directors and the cameraman, he said, OK, let me tell you, gentlemen, what a close-up is. It's that. I, he said... Don't give me wide rural shots. I want close-ups. And he re... This was in the, like, early 60s, but he mm. rewrote the reality to... Well, no. You're it didn't going exist, to yeah. He created that world. Yeah. And we were sort of following from that. And also, of course, by, by that time, I mean, by 69, 16 millimeter had become the television format. The cameras were com compared to 35 mil were incredibly lightweight and you could, you know, they, they were very mobile. We see Tony on the rooftop taking his uh, airy BL, even like you said, with the big yeah. thousand foot uh, magazine on it, just laying down on his back and aiming up at, uh, at, uh, at John. Yeah. I mean, it, they, they, it was. He couldn't totally do that with the 35. Yeah. Yeah, no, you, I mean, we did have 35 mil cameras that could be handheld, but they had four minutes of film. So, right. I mean, which would not have been that useful. What is very interesting, which, in fact, Matt, in some of your interviews, you sparked in me, what is unbelievable was how little lens choice we had back in 69. Mm. Um, the Japanese would you had barely put their foot into the they've got stills lenses but the japanese hadn't really touched much into cine um nor had zeiss zeiss made a couple but you basically had three manufacturers Tanavision and you, know, you had bosch and lom in america yeah you had taylor hobson in england and schneider in germany and the zooms were all on Genoa from france and that was the choice. Yeah. When I talk to young colleagues today, and they're going through this agonizing process of what of the scores of lenses they're going to use on the next project, I think, you know, I feel, I feel for them because yeah. our decision yeah, was right. a lot easier. But to tell, us, uh, to tell us about the what it was like. You, you, you and I had talked about this. You know, kind of the approach of how you guys shot at Twickenham, just you and Tony. Yeah, so, I mean, at Twickenham, I mean, we were very unsure of the ground. We didn't, I mean, yeah, walk, walk into this big barn of a stage and there's this little area set up and Tony's got some lights on it. But um, we really have no idea what we're going to encounter you know, personally. So initially, we did start off on quite long lenses. Although I'm filming a close-up, as close-up as you and I are, I'm probably half a basketball court away. Right. So a lot of times I can't hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not that they, the sound guys are getting it all, but I'm just going on right. what's in my viewfinder. And right. I don't so as, have... right. So as an operator, you're used to being able to, you're right. If you were with filming an, a, 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 a theatrical film, you'd be right there with the actors and hearing lines. But here oh, yeah. you're, you're at a distance because you have to be. Yeah, so an awful lot of the conversation that we would have filmed, I would have filmed in Twickenham, I didn't hear precisely what they were saying because mm -hmm. we were purposely backed off a lot. And then once, once, every, once a day, um, Tony would have me climb up God knows how many steps to go into the roof of the stage, which was about three and a half stories high, to do these big high wide shots 
because Tony had evolved this idea that each day he would add a bit of lighting so it would sequentially move through. That beautiful, that beautiful colored lighting we see in the background yeah. on yeah. the big psych cyclorama, yeah. big white background. I mean, um, it was just an idea that Tony had that eventually, if they did the concert, or if they did a concert in Twickenham, you'd have seen the whole lighting plan evolve and become the finished one. Uh, wow. That wasn't played out, but that's why the lighting changes. Um, because when the final uh, Peter Jackson films come to light, I mean, I'm sure the editor was throwing, was wanted to jump off a cliff because the continuity <laughs> in the background was never the same. Sure, and sure. So I, I do feel for how they must, and I'm sure in the end they just came to the decision, the background is doesn't matter. We're cutting the story of the boys. So, um, but it was an interesting idea that sort of, went off that didn't ever get to completion. You're with the Beatles and spending that much time with them. Who do you think you were closest with? Like, is there one that stands out that used to come up to you and say some jokes to you or let you in on what's going on or treated you like a friend? Who, who basically did you bounce off more than anyone else? John was always distant. I mean, he was relaxed in front of the camera, but no, I would... If you said, you know, did I ever get across the personal offence with John? No. Um, he, he was, you know, not cold, but, you know, he just, it, it wasn't, he reacted to the camera, but that was the camera. It wasn't reacting to me. Um, Paul was always that sort of slightly business-like, but, you know, he was, he was relaxed. He was friendly. He treated, I mean, one day I came back from lunch and Paul was chatting to this lad, a, 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 boy, a young, young man, I, uh, when he went, I said, oh, who was that, Paul? He said, oh, it was a bloke I went to school with. He said, I, you know, when they're in town, they frequently ring me up. I see them all, but it's always a bit sad because we don't have anything in common anymore. Hmm. So, I mean, Interesting. Paul was that, you know, but yes, he, he was fine. I mean, talk to him and all the rest of it, but Paul was very focused on Beatle. I guess Ringo, Ringo and George were more relaxed. They would, have, they would always sort of chat to you. I mean... Yes, they, they knew me. They recognized me. They would say hello to me. Um, did I ever hear them once use my name? I don't think so. Hmm. But that there was no sort of barrier. I mean, and certainly by the time a few days into Savile Row, where we were much closer in the studio down there, it was just, you know, everyone was relaxed. Um, relaxed is probably not the right word, but there was no don't come in my space type tension. Mm -hmm. Um Cool. And they they were completely, um, I think it says something about the life of a Beatle is that the cameras never really phased them. They were just part of their world. For the last, what, eight years, some sort of paparazzi had been around them all the time, even though we weren't calling them that then. Um, so they, they were never, I mean, if you look at the whole of the footage, unless they wanted to, the Beatles, you never see them flick at the camera in the way most humans would. Yeah, John would do it. Do. Yeah, John would do it. Or no, you, met, I mean, you, so, you, had a, you had a line there about uh, what George said. He, he went, he looked right in the camera and said at Apple when the, the question of how, uh, the cost of all the tapes. Oh, yeah. I mean, George was a very technically technical musician. He knew his stuff. So at one point, he wanted to get uh, a Hammond organ amp to play his guitar through. And um, oh, you mean a Leslie speaker, rather? I thought it was an amp, an amplifier. This is the one thing that Matt found a little frustrating with me, I think, is that I'm a cameraman, I'm camera department. My knowledge of sound is about yay. <laughs> um, sound, you know, bear in mind, on a film crew, sound were often the pests who put their mics in shot. I had no need to know. I mean, so when Matt would ask me to identify a speaker or a bit of sound gear, yeah, why sure. would I know? But no, on this occasion, we'll call it this Hammond organ or uh, amp speaker. And Mal said, I can't get one. And so George said, Mal the roadie, that is, he said, just get onto Apple. They've got one and get them to send oh, one over. You, you mean EMI to Abbey Road? Yes, sorry, there... sorry. I beg your pardon. EM, he said EMI. You're right. And then George just pointedly looked into the camera and said, and do you know why EMI will send one over? Because before the Beatles, their shares were there. Now they're there. <laughs> so George was very, and George also made the comment one time, 
um, is that, um, do you know why we got the MBE? It was for um, foreign exchange. When, before we went to America, the pound and to the dollar was there. He said, now it's there. And that's mm -hmm. all us bringing. And to give you an idea of how much he's talking about, on the second day of our filming at Twickenham, the Beatle white double album went on sale in America. It went on sale at $7 a pop. And on day one, they sold 3 million copies. And George, more than the others, acknowledged and knew they were an industry. Is there a story that happened that you haven't told anybody? And if you want to share that story. There was one that uh, hasn't been made very public. Um, at Twickenham, there was this great talk about shipping the whole Capoodle down to an, a Roman amphitheatre ruin in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, it was going to be a huge event. And once again, they said, well, how are we going to get there? Are we going to put everyone on a boat? Are we going to do this and the other? And it was, again, George, who did one of his to camera, get in touch with General Lala over at the US Air Force Base in East Anglia. So the producer, Dennis O'Dell, rang him up and he came back and told us the story. He said it was amazing. He said, I rang this American Air Force general and said, look, the, we're trying to get to North Africa. And the Beatles thought you might have said, oh, the Beatles love those guys. They did a great charity show for us. He said, so what is it you want? And he said, well, we need to get a film crew um, and the Beatles and all the equipment to do a, a record, a concert to North Africa. And he said, ah. Oh, how much gear do you think you'd have about, you know, yah ya tons? He said, oh, that's easy. I'll get one of our star lifters. That'll take the whole lot of you. We've got a base 80 mile up the road, and we'll basically um, use it all as an exercise. I'll get a convoy, and we'll get you all set up. Not a problem. So we can, okay. <laughs> Incredible. So North Africa looked on, and Michael Lindsay Holt really could see this was going to be bigger than Ben-Hur. And he, you know, a thousand Arabs in saffron robes watching a Beatle concert. Yeah, it was, you could see, I mean, basically Mike Lindsay Hogg had bubbles coming out of his head of joy. Uh, <laughs> um, he, yeah, he well, talks about that in the film, doesn't he? He talks about all the, the Arabs in their robes watching, yeah. And then, so one afternoon, I, you know, just, I've gone off to the gents and I'm standing in a, a urinal just off the stage and suddenly Paul's alongside me. I have to say, it's a very strange moment sharing a gentleman's toilet with someone like a beetle. Anyway, so <laughs> you're desperately trying to look where you're supposed to. Anyway, so <clears throat> Paul said suddenly, what do you think about this North Africa thing? He said, what do you think about the concert there? I said, well, um, I, I said, it seems like it's going to be quite spectacular. He said, yeah, but he said, what do you think? He said, do you think it's worth it? Do you think it will work? Do you think, you know, what do you think? I said, well, I don't really know. I said, it's sort of, I'm sort of begging. It was above my pay grade. Please beam me up, Scotty. And, um, <laughs> and I, so I said, well, yeah. I, I said, look, I'm sure Michael and Tony, the camera, know what they're doing. I said, yeah, you know, Mike, Michael's got the experience. He said, yeah. He said, I'm still not sure. He said, I don't know if it's worth it. And away he went. Suddenly, out of one of the toilets comes Tony, the cameraman. And he said, Stum, do not get involved. Say nothing. He said, if Michael hears you white anting anything he wants to do, he said, don't get involved. I said, well, and, and Tony left. And I thought, well, yeah, but it's a bit hard to ignore a conversation when you're standing next to someone at a urinal. <laughs> you can't just leave now. <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic no, story because just... he hasn't shared that with anyone. And I mean, this is what I'm talking about, the net. It's instant. That place in Sabitha, Tripoli, right? And I saw the picture in the Get Back documentary, and then they had drawings and so forth, whatever they had. I personally yeah. reckon that would have been the concert of the future had they done it. I mean, that's just me. I reckon that would have been something so exhilarating with the water behind them, the desert, the actual place. It's unbelievable. I think you're right. I, I, look, I'm sure you're right. Um, my view at the time was... Please, God, make sure I don't forget any bit of gear on the camera side. <laughs> I mean, my, I, my focus was not on the show, the look. 
It was just on my role would have been to make sure we had all the equipment we needed. I think in a way for me to go to North Africa was just going to be a bloody big chore. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I wasn't looking at the artistic outcome. I was looking at how I was going to ensure all the nuts and bolts were there. And we had enough of everything we needed. Yeah. Had you and Tony talked about like what special things you had never got that far? Never quite. I mean, what Tony was more concerned about was that Tony had already he'd done a lighting list of what he needed down there. And we were going to have to take three 1000 amp Jennies, which were about the, yeah. um, they were longer. Uh, they were like the length of a city bus. Meaning generators. Generators. Yeah. yeah. And they were going to, because he was going to, because of North Africa, the sun, he was going to be taking down at least six or seven brute arcs. Now, a brute arc is about, uh, imagine a lamp that's got a two and a half foot lens on the front, uh, looking, you know, the same sort of lens that's in a lighthouse. And it took two men to lift it onto a stand. Right. You I mean, say br so a brute arc, meaning an arc light. An arc light. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the cables for just the cables that powered a brood arc uh, were as thick as your arm, mm. and a coil took a fit man to carry. So the the actual hardware for filming in North Africa in those days to the level that was required was massive. And God help you for if you get there and realize you need one other thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean it was. I mean the, the the electricians they they you know were all on top of theirs. But the, the chances that I could have forgotten a little bit of one lens that wouldn't go on all or what have you, it was I knew it was it was gonna be a nightmare. But um oh I say fortunately, but yeah, if we take your point about how spectacular it would have been, but that I have to be honest, was not my focus on the day. I mean, I gotta take my hat off to Michael Lindsay Hogg for having having so many cameras, having so many microphones recording everything that no one expected to see now. And when we look at this Get Back documentary, we're seeing you. We're seeing Michael Lindsay Hogg as a character, as a director. We're in between the Beatles. It's so real. As I said, for the new generation and the baby boomers, we're taken there, thanks to Michael Lindsay Hogg, for having the foresight to record and film everything. And you're part of that. I mean, that's just like history forever you've got to be proud of that well it's very interesting you you go down that line um up until this latest um release this latest i had a 52 year old memory of those events hmm. where they weren't historic at the time what this has all done um i'm discovered within myself it has seriously reconnected me emotionally with mm. that time, which up until a year ago was just simply a memory of another job I did. Yeah, an intro, yeah. But now, because it has become a part of history and inadvertently, accidentally, call it what you will, I was part of it. Um, and I do feel now something emotionally to that time that I'd never felt over the last 50 years. Talk about, you know, how things changed when you guys moved over to Apple. Um, just say how the environment was different and how, uh, you know, whereas you were sort of at a, at a distance and it was a cold environment over to Twickenham. Apple seemed to, everything seemed to warm up and, and you know, what was the relationship with you there in terms of comfort and well, uh, how, how you would shoot <laughs> it? It was almost like role reversal. Twickenham was a film studio. We were film people. Oh, yeah. The Beatles had done their films, and they were, shall we say, for want of a term, guests into that environment. When we got to the Apple Studios, it was a recording studio. That was their world. So we were now the sort of guests. But it was that not only it was it was their place. It was all of theirs. So it was a very relaxed. I mean, it was. Oh, I, I, in many ways, it was organized chaos you basically couldn't walk across the floor without stepping on a sound or light or, or a cable. There was stuff everywhere. Um, Tony had a rig that all the, there were no lights on the floor. So they just used some small, I, from memory, they could have been even almost semi-industrial lights little, but they were, they, they were small by film standards. Um, 
and they were all rigged in the ceiling. So there was yeah, we can the we can and we can finally see those now. Like we, you and I were talking Indeed. about the other day. Yeah, but I mean, like, once again, there was um, we had um, you mentioned earlier this sort of um, re sort of repartee type filming. What was interesting by default, by design, by it didn't matter. We would just shoot everywhere, and if we saw the other camera, or so it didn't matter because yeah. it was all part of it happening. And you know, it was much of a lot of it. I mean, that Apple Studio would not would have been a, probably about um, oh, slightly about the size of a badminton court. Yeah. So, and then you put in a, a grand piano, a, a drum kit, and God knows what. You were just always moving. I mean, the, the only thing they, I mean, there was one time the clapper loader, Paul, was standing by an open mic and he was um, humming along. And suddenly Paul said, <laughs> stop, 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 stop. Um, who's making that sort of clicking? No, and Paul said, oh, sorry, that was me. He said, ah, oh. he said, look, it's okay to be groovy with the music. Just don't do it by an open mic. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's cool. Plastic EP and Matt, thank you so much, Les Parrot, for being on the show. And let me tell you, Beatle fans all around the world salute you. They watch your film, and it's just a fantastic part of history now that you're part of. And as I said, you know, this is Beatle history and getting bigger and bigger, and the Beatles are the biggest thing today in 2021. And, Les, you're part of it. So we congratulate you. What a great achievement and career. Thank you for being too kind. Thank you very much indeed.